Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew, from the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 35. Listen for the word of the Lord. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he says, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. A story is told of two friends who were walking through the desert. During some point along the journey, they had an argument. The one friend slapped the other friend in the face. The one who got slapped was hurt, but without saying anything, wrote in the sand. Today, my best friend slapped me in the face. They kept on walking until they found an oasis where they decided to take a bath. The one who had been slapped got stuck in the mire and started to drown, but the friend saved him. After he recovered from nearly drowning, he wrote on a stone, Today, my best friend saved my life. His friend spoke to him, saying, I'm confused. After I hurt you, you wrote in the sand, and now you write on a stone. Why? The other friend replied, When someone hurts us, we should write it down in sand, where the winds of forgiveness can erase any thoughts of holding a grudge or seeking revenge. But when someone does something good for us, we should engrave it on stone so it will never be forgotten. One of the basic tenets of the Christian faith is their willingness to forgive. Real forgiveness isn't about forgetting. It would almost be impossible for humans to forget when they are hurt by another person. What forgiveness does mean is getting rid of the resentment and the need for revenge so that healing can take place. As Christians, we know we are supposed to forgive. Every Sunday we repeat the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But even though we expect God to forgive us, and we know that God wants us to forgive those who have sinned against us, we find it very difficult to do so, often saying, I just can't bring myself to forgive Peter or James or whoever. Refusing to forgive someone who has harmed us not only runs contrary to the will of God, but adds to our anxiety. All it accomplishes is making us bitter and resentful, which only adds to our distress. Sadly, I find people particularly hesitant to forgive at funerals and weddings two events that should bring family and friends closer to each other. People tell me, Pastor, I can't tell you whether or not my brother is coming to Dad's funeral. He and Dad 
never got along. Or at weddings, I get really nervous when the bride comes to me and says, Pastor, I just found out my dad is coming to the wedding and my dad and mom haven't spoken to each other since the divorce. Now, a wedding should be the perfect time for a divorced couple to come and celebrate the marriage of their daughter and maybe even find reconciliation. But I can tell by the tone of the daughter's voice that she's preparing me for World War III. If we can't find reconciliation and forgiveness among family during times of mourning or times of great joy, how in the world are we supposed to extend forgiveness to our enemies? and those who persecute us as Jesus taught. If the truth be told, the human creature isn't very good at forgiving. William Willimon, renowned pastor and retired bishop in the United Methodist Church once wrote, the human animal is not supposed to be good at forgiveness. Forgiveness is not some innate natural human emotion. Vengeance, retribution, Violence, these are the natural human characteristics. It is natural for the human animal to defend itself. We snarl when we are threatened. We crouch into a defensive position when attacked. We bite when bitten. Forgiveness is not natural. It's not a universal human virtue. Therefore, we have to be intentional about offering forgiveness. But even though forgiveness is difficult, Jesus is quite direct in acknowledging that forgiveness is the rule of life God desires for all of God's people. Hence, our gospel lesson today is on forgiveness. How often and how much. Jesus doesn't initiate the conversation. His friend and disciple Peter does. He wants to know how often we are to forgive someone. Peter, I suspect, felt that he was being more than generous when suggesting forgive people seven times. After all, first century Jewish tradition instructed that people need only be given a maximum of three opportunities to forgive. Jesus sets the record straight. In the Greek, the number of times forgiveness is offered, offered can either be translated 77 times as in my Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, or seven times 70, as in the King James Bible, or 490 times. Either way, Jesus' answer proclaims that there is no limit to the number of times we forgive someone. From a Christian perspective, we never stop forgiving and never close the door on the possibility of forgiveness. Jesus then offers a practical application of this instruction by telling this familiar parable of the unforgiving slave in order to help us understand the importance of enacting mercy within the Christian life. The parable is a story about a king who declares, or who decides rather, to conduct an audit of his accounts. He discovers that one of his slaves owes him an enormous amount of money, 10,000 talents. According to Charles Cusar in the commentary text for preaching, he estimates the sum of 10,000 talents is more than the wages of a day laborer for 150,000 years. It is an amount of money that would be impossible to repay. The king calls the slave in and demands payment. When the slave cannot pay, the king orders the slave to be sold along with his wife and children. The slave falls on his knees, pleading for more time to pay, as if he could ever repay such a sum. To the astonishment of all, the king's heart is touched, and instead of giving the man more time, the king forgives the entire debt. He wipes it clean. You might say the slave deserved to be punished. That would have been justice, but instead of receiving justice, he received mercy and forgiveness. From the king's perspective, mercy was more important than retributive justice. Nice story so far, but it's about to take an unexpected turn. On the way out of the king's home, he runs into a fellow slave who owes him a debt of a hundred denarii. Now, a hundred denarii is a sizable amount, but minuscule in comparison to the amount of debt the first slave was forgiven by the king. 
but not remembering the gigantic amount he himself had been forgiven, he grabs the man by the throat and shouts, pay me what you owe. But the man doesn't have the money and falls down on his knees, making the same plea for patience as the first slave did to the king. But it falls on deaf ears. The first slave orders the second slave thrown into prison until he or his family can repay the debt. Unfortunately for this unforgiving slave, there were witnesses to his merciless behavior, and they reported it to the king. In anger, the king called the slave before him and said, You worthless slave, I forgave you that whole amount you owed me, more than you could have paid me back in a thousand lifetimes. Yet you could not extend that mercy to your fellow slave, whose debt was but a pittance compared to yours. The king ordered the slave to be tortured until he could pay the debt in full. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the point Jesus is trying to make to his disciples. As so often the case, Jesus creates an allegory. The king, of course, is God, and his disciples, both then and now, are representative of the slave who owes the king a tremendous debt because of our sins. In God's unfathomable mercy and love, God sent his only son to suffer and die on the cross so our sins could be wiped out and our debts paid in full. There is no way we could ever pay God back for the sins we have committed. And yet God, in God's infinite mercy and compassion, forgives us all our debts. Therefore, we should not be like that wretched slave who was forgiven such a great amount by the king, but in turn could not mirror the same compassion, mercy, and forgiveness that had been extended to him. In grateful response to the cancellation of the debt to God, a debt that we could never have repaid, we are called to forgive the debts of those who have sinned against us. Point is, if we're not willing to show compassion and mercy and forgiveness in this life, why should we expect God to show compassion, forgiveness, and mercy when we are held accountable for our sins in this life or in the life to come? Every once in a while, we hear stories of people who do forgiveness right. Such was the story of the Amish community of Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, who had to deal with the horror of the school shootings of October the 2nd, 2006. The slaughter of five school girls and the wounding of five others by a gunman who then shot himself was an unimaginable trauma for any communi community, but especially for the deeply religious, nonviolent people like the Amish. The world watched to see the elders of this radically peaceful community, how they would respond. What the world saw was a remarkable Christian witness. One of the first things the Amish did was reach out to the gunman's widow and let her children uh, and, and feed them. They brought food so that they could eat. They raised money to help them pay their bills on top of everything else, the family had lost its principal wage enter. Ten days after the shooting, a bulldozer crashed through the walls of that little Amish schoolhouse at Nickel Mines. Anyone familiar with the Amish knows bulldozers aren't their style. They don't use that kind of machinery. And besides, they're a thrifty bunch. When demolishing a building, they typically descend upon it with nail pullers and crowbars, laboriously salvaging as much lumber as they can. You can think of it as a form of Amish recycling. Yet on this occasion, the Amish hired an outside non-Amish contractor to drive his bulldozer through the building, reducing it to splinters. They wanted the world to see that they were absolutely determined to forgive and forget, and quickly. To them, that public witness was well worth the cost of hiring the bulldozer and giving up the salvage value of the scrap lumber. Jesus teaches his disciples that as his followers, they need to take forgiveness seriously. At the close of his parable, Jesus told his disciples that the king had the unforgiven slave tortured 
until he could repay the entire debt and suggest that the same outcome exists for those who fail to exercise forgiveness from the heart. Does that mean that God will punish us if we fail to forgive from the heart? That's the wrong question. A better question is, shouldn't we want to please God and obey Jesus who taught us to pray, Our Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Think about it for a minute. In Jesus Christ, God has forgiven us our sins, a debt we could never possibly repay. Shouldn't we in turn forgive those who have sinned against us? May we strive to be more like Jesus who forgave even those who nailed him to the cross. May our hurts be written in sand so that the winds of forgiveness can erase any thoughts of holding a grudge or seeking revenge. Forgiveness isn't always easy, but God doesn't ask us to do what can't be done. With God's help, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the winds of forgiveness can erase the hurts and enable us to forgive others as we have been forgiven. The end result is that we not only please God, we develop a more loving and non-anxious lifestyle. May God continue to mold and remake us into the image of Christ who forgives us all our sins. Amen.